Earl was one of our first students in the program back in 2009. The first couple of students actually started the second semester that the program was developed, so he came in one semester after the program first started. Uh, Earl uh, has, as I remember, eight years of Navy experience. Sure. <clears throat> So Earl came to us with a lot of technical skills already, and uh, he was uh, attending another campus. And as we started this program, uh, Ronnie Carr, who was also one of my instructors when I went through the program, said, Earl, I want to check out the building automation program. So we had the pleasure of meeting Earl and putting him in that first cohort of students. Uh, Earl was a leader from the very beginning and became the president of our Building Technologies Club, which was also managing the subchapter of ASHRAE. So Earl was able to uh, join us in Las Vegas at the at ASHRAE's expense, along with another student. Uh, we went to Skills USA, where he won a national medal for a scale model building that was automated based on the design of an architect named William McCullough, who designed a building of the future of War Time magazine. And so we did a replica of that, and put in several sleepless nights, I think, getting that thing ready, commissioned, taking it to national competition. And won an award for that. Just a number of things. Earl provided a great deal of leadership for our students. Uh, the cookouts we talked about earlier, that was Earl running that as well. So we're very pleased to have him. And it just, as he speaks, you'll see why uh, he's been so successful in the field after leaving the program. His social skills, communication skills are, I would say, even more important to success in the field than the technical skills. We hear that from industry consistently, and Earl's a prime example. So uh, help me welcome good friend and uh, proud graduate of the program for Mark Earl Earl. in the broadcast services group where we kind of maintained the emergency communication network in Illinois. Did that for several years and went from there um, down to Georgia. And I thought with my background it would be relatively easy to come down here and get a job um, in electronics or working. And found out that, that wasn't the case. The economy was nose diving. Um, no one was hiring. And I had about two years left on my GI Bill. So it felt like it uh, might be a good idea to avoid doing what so many others had been and just put money into the GI Bill and did not get the education out of it. And I decided to go to school. Uh, right around that time, my HVAC at home actually broke. And so I went up to the HVAC unit and pulled the cover off. I had never worked on the unit before. And I seen what I always liked to see, which was a wiring schematic. I said, okay, I got a chance here, you know. And I went through the wiring schematic and I said, man, this thing is actually pretty simple here, you know. So I said, well, it's the South. It's always hot. We want to be comfortable. A two-year degree. I almost can't lose if I go ahead and get an education in HVAC here in, in Georgia. And so I went to school thinking I would go to school and get some learning on HVAC. And at the very least, if no one ever wanted to hire me, I could get a job and, and start my own company. Service and air conditioning units. I could eat. I could feed my family just doing that, if nothing else. Um, but as Brian mentioned, I got to school and Ronnie Carr was the instructor. And he said, you should actually look into building automation. And I'm so glad he did. Had no idea what building automation was. It sounded pretty um, sophisticated to me. And when I got into the program, I found out it was just that. So great opportunity for us in this field. Um, I went through the program. Um, in the program, we got exposed to student activities, where is where we really got the experience of um, me being from Detroit, not really knowing many people here in Georgia. I had the opportunity then to meet local um, people and get, and get familiar with the culture here in Georgia. Uh, what are some of the places you want to go and eat and dine and take your kids and family? So I really got to kind of get to know people through the student activities. Um, also, while at the college, we got involved with ASRAE. Um, everyone familiar with Ashray? Okay, so they have a local chapter right here in Atlanta. All the more reason, you know, God bless all the other states, but if you're in Atlanta, there is no reason you shouldn't be involved with HVAC 
there's a wealth of information right here in Atlanta. Um, every day on my job, ASRAE is in some way involved with commissioning a laboratory, starting up a university uh, classroom, some kind of way we're using the ASRAE guideline or something, you know. Uh, we deal with fume hoods a lot, and they are the go-to authority in most cases on fume hoods. So with all that said, uh, we started a chapter here at the school, an ASRAE student chapter, which gave us memberships in ASRAE access to the meetings with all the engineers discussing how to better do things in the industry. I mean, this is a wealth of information that you just don't get all over the U.S. While a student here, I got a Facebook from a young lady in, I want to say some country in Northwest Africa. Forgive me for not remembering the exact country. But she was trying to start up a hospital, HVAC, and she was Googling stuff and found some keywords on our Facebook and was asking me how to go about starting up this hospital. And I'm like, you were probably asking the worst person in the world how to start up something because I'm a student. I know absolutely nothing about starting anything, but I was able to get her over to Ray, some engineers, and I don't know how it turned out for her, but I sus suspect that things went well for her. I don't know for sure. Um, the whole point is... Um, access to ASRAE, the student club activities, um, led to me eventually finishing the program here and being offered an opportunity with a company called TriTech. It's a local company, it's a small company, and we design and manufacture controls for um, critical airflow environments. We manufacture venturi valves and the controllers for pressure control, fume hook control. Uh, we deal with Backnet communications, long communications, into communications, okay? And we build the networks in software, in graphical form. If you want first pre-commissioning, make sure it works. And we can come on site and get it started up for you, just like that. What I have found in this industry, there's an absolute absence of skill for the technician. We have engineers, but the technician, the in-between guy, the, the engineer, and the labor, there's an absolute absence in this industry for that position. So much so that if you're a technician and you halfway know what you're talking about, you'll be getting offered jobs to do engineering work. And that's not a credit to the technician as much as we need to get more techs and engineers in this industry. Because what happens is we end up wasting a lot of money on building projects because some engineer is copying and pasting his way through, okay, and we get on the job site and the air flows don't match. I got conflicts in mechanical drawings and valve schedules. The air flows are different. Someone decides to save money, so they take equipment out the drawings, but don't adjust any of the numbers in the drawings. And then we get on site and they say, well, just make it work. Well, that's going to be very expensive because testing balance times, his time is money, my time is money, everyone's time is money. And it could all be avoided if we just had more engineers and technicians in the industry um, working. This is not a smokescreen industry. If you get the skill, there's plenty of opportunity in the industry for you. It don't matter if you're male or female. It don't matter if you're big or small because there's so many different things to be done. You have drawings, you have submittals, you have writing sequence of operations. These are real things in this industry that people are retiring and leaving vacancies in the industry right now. And we need students here, man. You know, it's got to be true because I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to compete against me in the industry. That's how bad we need people in this industry. Students, it's never too late. Doesn't matter if you're 19, 20, 30, 40. I was 40 almost when I came into the industry. 40 years old and starting over a new career and making more than I've ever made in any other industry. And I've got to tell you, electronic technicians get paid fairly well in this country. That's how much opportunity there is here in demand. In one year, the last 12 months I've been to Qatar, Sweden, all over the U.S., every job site that I've been to, I've been invited to work for someone's company at that location. And it's not because I'm so smart. 
It ain't because I'm so pretty. I guarantee you that. But it is because there's an absolute demand for skills on these job sites, right? They need someone that's going to come in with some idea of linearization, right? Some idea of HVAC, some idea of how to read a mechanical drawing. You don't have to be an engineer. But they need someone to come in with a clue of how to do these things. And that's where you guys come in at, you know? Um, on a personal note, I think we put too much focus on the four-year university being the only way to be successful. Um, education in all forms is always a win, in my personal opinion. But you can contribute a great deal to this country, to yourself, in a lot of different ways. And a four-year university is not the only way. It's not. It used to be okay to be an electrician, a plumber, uh, to be a, a construction man. It used to be okay, honorable, to do these things. Some kind of way we went left and started thinking that unless you get a four-year degree, you're a failure. That is so wrong. There are so many jobs that still need to be done by quality electricians. I normally spend the first three days on every job site fixing wiring. When I was coming up, there were certain basic things to wire that are just gone. When you terminate a wire, there was a way to terminate a wire where you left a little one eighth of copper exposed, right? So you can see it's terminated, but at the same time, you make sure it's secure. Now I see termination sticking this far out from the termination, which is a problem. Just a matter of time before they start to touch, right? I see where they crimp down on the insulation. You think something's not working. And it's because they're not on the copper, they're on the insulation. These are like basic, basic things that can be learned and enforced at the journey level or the two-year university. And we can make such a difference in people's lives, through income, um, and education if they just had the skill. But first, they need to be made aware that the opportunity is there. Um, and I don't know how you're going to do it, but that's what we need to do. Make them aware of the opportunity. So, my company has contributed some uh, materials to the school here because from the first time the first student came in from this school to my small company, the only thing the owners had to ask, can we get more? Can we get more? Do you know anyone else going to the program? One, two, three, four, five students have come out of this program and into the company and all have done very well except the ones who wanted to leave for personal reasons. One guy wanted to start his own business. So he wanted to spend his time doing his journeyman time to get the time on his belt to get his license. But everyone else has done well. What they learned from the program that came in so handy, the introduction to HVAC, first of all, you just don't get that everywhere, right? And no matter how advanced you get, you never get away in this industry, controls building energy from having to know something about HVAC. Is such a major part of the cost of running the building, right? And so, HVAC, uh, basic AC <coughs> theory, these are the basic things that you have to know. Entry level coming in, right? Um, Excel, spreadsheets. A lot of the work we do are done on spreadsheets. Now, I was not unfamiliar with Excel when I came into the program, but guess what? These things. Programs, computers are growing and changing so fast. What you knew three years ago is not the latest and greatest three years later. It's outdated now. They're doing other things now. So when I came through the program, you know, you had to take introductory to work office programs, right? So it refreshed my memory of all these neat little things you can do with Excel and how you could always make Excel a living program. Like, we was running our production off of Excel, basically, right? Not the calibration aspect of it, but keeping the record side of it. And because we're selling calibrate metering devices, we have to be able to pre pre present <coughs> um, evidence that it was calibrated. Here are the numbers to go with this serial number. If there's ever a question, and we got to be going back 10 years if need be, right? And as a matter of fact, when people were hired, we had other hirees coming from other places. The challenge that most people had was Word office. They had the skill to do mechanical things, but they had been out of school so long, 
Try to know how to manipulate uh, Excel and where to put things on, on, the, on the file is just too much of a challenge. They say, I'd rather just deal with the wrench and the screwdriver. I don't want to deal with that. Well, that's a that's a real aspect of the job. And so the student that comes in that can deal with it, and not only can deal with it, but can make it even more efficient, which is what I did coming in from right from school, right? Um, make someone say, hey, maybe we can put him over here so he can do this, right? And then we have him over here so he can do this. And you find yourself moving, like I progress very fast in the company, and I'm not the only one, but the opportunity is there, right? And people just need to get the information, the students. So, with that, are there any questions? Could you give it a, a range of what somebody coming out of the program like this would expect to be their starting salary in the Atlanta area? So I talked to other technicians, and people are kind of funny about talking about what they really make. You know? Sure. Um, but I, I think it's reasonable to expect 40 to 45 before you prove yourself. Just coming in the door. 40 to 45 before you prove yourself? As a starting job? But that's, that's just my opinion. Yeah. And I've only spoke with uh, JCI and Kelly, these guys, because the, and you guys may know more about those particular companies than even I do. But basically, once you prove yourself within those companies, you kind of get graduated to a particular system or task, right? You'll come out of this program doing the same thing that that person that has graduated to a level is doing. And so it won't take long before you're working with them and their supervisor saying, man, where, where did you come from? Where did you get the training at? You know, where, where, did you, where did you go to school at? It's happening every job. I had a guy here that's, um, for your degree, Johnson Patrol, and he's in pursuit of regional management, right? He was a manager, a project, was a project manager, but he wanted to be a regional manager. And I'm, I'm advising him on how to select the right devices for the application that we're trying to put in on the project. I've only been out of school two years. But it's, and it's not such about me, it's about taking the time to understand here's a problem, what's the logical approach? Whereas a lot of people just wait for someone to give them the answer, right? Give me, just give me the device. If you give me the device, my job is to put it in. If it don't work, it's not my problem, right? That's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach, because it costs time and money. And if you really want to be successful, be the guy that can say, not only just the wrong device, here's why it's wrong, here's the right device, and here's why I think it's right. Now let's run this five minutes here and see what he has to say. If you do that on every problem, you're going to find yourself moving right on up the ladder real quick. Um, so I was in 40, 45 years, and, and it won't take long before you go way past that. I find the average rate to be around 55. Is that a year or not? Uh, a year, 55,000 a year. <laughs> That's more reasonable. Yeah. The hourly pay is, is about um, 18 and 19 when you first started coming down, which is not, that's not bad, that's not the worst thing in the world. I can assure you that people working in the factories making less than that has been there 13, 14 years. College graduates this year are going to average less than that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real opportunity here. Yeah, a question for you relative to student um, programs or, or committees you're involved with. It, in my college, Tech College, the students try to start up some student chapters um, looking at ASHRAE or, or Wisconsin Association of Energy Engineers or just a sustainability club. And what I found is they, they want to do it, but they really didn't have the time to do it because oh, they're like you, you know, 40 years old, mm -hmm. family, most of them have a full time job too. They're trying to get that little at, at it. So, it was difficult getting programs going, and so we didn't get any clubs going up and running. Mm -hmm. How would you do it? I didn't do it alone. That's how I did. Yeah. Um, I, we had a, we, our membership grew at its peak to about 80, was about 83 members. <coughs> by far the largest student club on this campus. Wow. But out of 83 members, I probably had eight. That was really my reliable go to. No matter what, we the pinnacle, we're going to be there, we're going to make sure. There's someone that'll start up the event. There's someone that'll clean up after the event. About eight. A lot of people would 
Still here some money. This time, the next time, we got a little time. How do we do it? Uh, the best thing I see is trying to identify people who are high energy, who have a personal sense of commitment. It is not so easy. I think I just got lucky to some extent. Uh, and, you know, Ryan, he's so much energy and got too many <laughs> things going at one time. So it was easy to work with him and, and get this started up. But um, I worked, uh, I had a full time job. I was in school doing the program and green, we had a green technologies uh, program as well. So I was doing them both door and working full time and uh, almost coaching my kids' soccer team at the same time. <laughs> my time was varied, a lot of right? But if you're going to do it, why do it half? Why, yeah. why do it half speed? And I think a lot of people around me felt the same way, at least three or four other guys felt the same way. And so we kind of fed off of each other. Maybe one day I wasn't feeling, you know, like leading the race, but because I had surrounded myself by motivated students, um, when, you know, this day mm -hmm. was kind of leading the pack, you know. I would say just support them, suggest ideas or things to do, and then even when you got to go beyond supporting, kind of, kind of pull them mm -hmm. through it to get it going, right? And don't let them be isolated from the rest of the student body, right? So I think the reason we grew so fast because we was not trying to hold a little event in our classroom, but we go out to the corridor out there in the patio and have a barbecue. And so everyone is kind of walking past, like, well, what are these guys doing, you know? Okay, come on and get a burger. Have a, so they, they, they from, from the outside looking in, we just having fun, we're having a good time. Yeah. Right? So where everyone is kind of ready to have to spend time at school, we looked like we was having a good time. And so when you came to our meetings, we want to respect your time and not waste time chitter chatting. Let's go with the subject matter. What are we trying to do? So that organization, I think, appealed to some. Right? <clears throat> and uh, it was sort of started to grow. Before the student club, I had been in an organization that kind of had some sense of how to run a meeting, but I didn't know for sure. I had never been in the chair of running the meeting, but once I was elected to be the president, I immediately needed to find out how to not waste my students' time. And that's how I felt, really. Yeah. How to not waste my students' time. They got families at home, right? They're tired at the end of the day. When we have a meeting, I don't want to have a chitter chatter going back and forth about what you think, right? When the floor is open, have an idea, put it on the table, second that motion, let's move on through here. People kind of respect that. And, and I think from the organization and the respect of the time, we kind of grew, right? There was not a lot of sitting around, <sighs> and that's when you start to lose people. When they come in the evening, and the, it, it, it feeds off the professor, to tell you the truth, it really does. If he's uncomfortable with what he's doing, and so he comes in kind of like, uh, right, there's no way you're going to electrify the, the audience yeah. like that. So yeah. when he's charged, okay, we got to get to it, get to it, okay, now they kind of feed off their energy. And I think that played a big role in the success of those student um, organizations. What kind of activities did you do? We have a club, and mm -hmm. sometimes we struggle on what kind of we have a requirement as a school club to provide some sort of service. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested in some kind of the activity. So one of the first things we did um, was pick the local high school, a local school, and decided we were going to take a role in going to that school and speaking to the student body about sustainable technologies. Now, um, that was a way to get us energized to do something while also getting out into the community, okay? And so here we are now trying, trying to get our studies, but now we have to learn a little bit more about um, sustainable technologies, enough to stand in front of the audience and speak. And this is a high school, was it high school? Yeah. High school students and you lose their attention real quick, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't keep it moving. And I have to say we all did very well. Um, but that kind of allowed us to find something that was, I, I like to say dynamic and active and not just uh, uh, hot dogs and hamburgers, you know, which are fun, which is fun too, because we had the music going and we wasn't just barbecuing, we were just trying to have a good time, we had a good time. But that came after, and we had a few different events, we had the bowling event, bowling party, 
Um, everything we did, I tried to refrain from, even when it got quite and still, from just saying we're going to do something. I tried to always make sure I made whatever we did a part of the whole group's collective decision, right? Give me something. You want to go bowling? Great. Where are we going to go bowling at? Where do you not want to go? And we had students that say, well, I don't want to go bowling over there. If they do things over there that I don't want to be around, you know? And, uh, okay, well, anyone else go that way? A very democratic. Yeah, okay, where are we going? Let's talk to this. Where else do we go? Well, you know, so trying to involve the people. At the end of the day, it's just energy. I think you got to have some kind of energy. And like I say, it starts from the top. So if you get energized about the prospects of the program, it can filter down the student body. I will say with all honesty, if you're tired and exhausted in teaching, it's unrealistic for you to expect your classroom to be charged up and energized. It's just not fair. It's not, that's, not, that's not how we work as human beings. We feed off of each other, we do. So, um, sorry, you know, and that, you know, can, can you give it a little bit more? Because that I had almost forgotten about that. Uh, mm -hmm. What you did at Clarkston High School mm -hmm. it was such a unique experience for you guys and for the high school students, the art students. Mm -hmm. and, and that trailer is not wrapped, by the way. So you have. To oh really? It. <laughs> but um, I think they enjoy hearing that story. Right? Okay, so we we what we wanted to do. We were learning all so so. Mm -hmm. We were learning so much new information about sustainable technologies that we were just kind of. I know I wasn't familiar with half the stuff we learned about. And so we thought, uh, and help me remember some of the details now, we were going to, we wanted to involve the community in the idea of sustainable technologies. For example, we wanted people in the community to know there is a business opportunity in disposing of grease, in cooking oil even, right? Now we can talk about it in the classroom all day long, but we decided we wanted to some kind of way to take a role in at least our immediate community, letting them know there's a way to make money if you want to on the weekends. Helping people dispose of cooking oil. Okay, great. So how are we going to get out to the community? So this was a process, right? Maybe, maybe you were, were you involved with the art students over there, or was that what the students right after you? Probably right after me. I, knew, I heard some of them trailer. We didn't do anything work after the Oh, trailer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So, so, sorry. so what they did, you were doing the biodiesel fuel. Right. Yeah, conversion from oil. But, but the subsequent students, um, they went to the high school, <coughs> they sponsored the same club. Mm -hmm. And I think this is when Russell Bowe was running the club. Okay. Um, in our competition. So they had raised money. The Earl was very effective in raising money for the club. And they had excess yeah. funds. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they went over there and had a competition. You remember correct. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell the story? Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, so to get them energized, once again, we decided to, I think it was have an art competition on the students' um, idea of sustainable technologies, right? And there was a money, cash money for whoever won first prize. The cash prize was going to come from our pot that we had here, you know, made over here the cookouts and whatnot. And so we went to the student body, the high school students, say anybody want to win $100, basically, you know. Oh, they woke up there, you know, yeah, 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 okay, well, all you got to do is draw a picture based on what we're going to talk to you about over the next 30 minutes, sustainable technologies. And there's no judgment on what you consider to be sustainable technologies. So all we're just trying to do is get them to listen, basically, you know. And so we took turns speaking on different aspects of how sustainable technologies affect them every day. And that was the focus of the way we told to discuss it, right? Not just talk about... Um, you know, some scientific theories that we don't even understand, but how does it relate to your everyday environment? And they caught, they kind of, they really bit onto it, and we had over 15, it had to be like 20 different, they went around the room, drawings where students were trying to win, and it was a real, real success. And it, it just reminded me of how, how hungry the kids are to be recognized and appreciated, right? Because a lot of the kids in that particular school spend a lot of time probably just dealing with behavioral issues um, outside of trying to learn anything. This was an opportunity for them to be recognized for doing something that was cool to some extent. Well, well after you left, you might not be aware of this, but those designs were collected. There was a one 
top, second, and third prize. So $175, $50. And then the school has a trailer, a uh, trailer for sustainability. They, they wrapped it in the student design. That's right. And took that to the community. They still have that trailer. So the it's energy, a, was it the winners? Design they kind of went around the trailer, or they took the they put the ground the top of the redesign, okay. and they had the graphic artists here then had the trailer wrap. Okay. And so it, this idea of energy and building that culture, mm -hmm. I'll tell you when Earl was here and the other students were running the club, that's when the numbers in our programs, just what you said, people were wondering what was going on, the numbers just spiked. I mean, it was it was just a clear spike because it wasn't being then the culture was being driven by the instructors. Mm -hmm. It, it was for being driven by students. Yeah, yeah. And, there's a difference. And then I would say a big part of that was uh, not just being in, in a little cocoon of classroom, off in the corner of the other building. You know, it was all about getting out to the community. And other students would see us getting out or, or having events. Heck, not, how can I be a part of that? And they might even have a little sister or brother, you know, that went to a school and they kind of appreciate that we was interacting with the schools and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, that was real. I forgot all about that. That was a real success. Yeah. Um, Brian did mention going to Vegas doing an ASRAE. Um, that was a real experience. And I got to say, building, what we did was we submitted a project. And I have to say, there weren't many two year universities there. The majority of the school students that were there were from four year universities. So we were competing against um, science students at four year universities. Um, and we came in third place. A convention, I think we could have won second, actually, but we, we made a, a scale side of the building, it's about so tall up the floor, circular, rotated on the axis. And the idea was, uh, and they had little figurines on the inside, um, had light control, had real, had circular floors. The whole idea was to have the building shaded on one side and it rotated to block the sun at all times to save energy in the building. We had T stacks in the building that showed the heating on each floor. <clears throat> so you could see the temperature on each floor of the building based on when lights were on, LEDs were on or not inside the little, the little cavity right now. So uh, it was pretty nice. We had a little park outside the building. The whole thing price mm, four by two on the base. We rolled around pretty good, you know. And so uh we did very really well. We had to get up and speak about the building, all the technology in the building. And we were shocked that we came in third. You know, like I say, there weren't many two year universities there. I want to say maybe three, you know, out of like 20. They were all four year schools and uh, engineering students, right? Um, and it was quite the experience. When I got into the field, some of the concepts that we were dealing with in our building were directly applicable. To so my very first job, my very first job was at Georgia Tech. They were converting the whole floor into uh, 18 laboratory classrooms. One classroom had 15 fume hoods in one class, it's a lot of airflow. And another classroom had 10 fume hoods. No wall in between these two classrooms, so it's essentially one volume of space. That's just one, that's just two, one or two classrooms, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, we dealt with issues where a temperature sensor on the exterior wall of the building is inside the classroom, but there's no insulation behind that sensor. And the exterior the temperature outside was directly affecting the controls inside the room. I had never even thought about something like this could happen, right? And I'm the one that figured it out. Because I kept looking at this number on my temperature, like, why is this number so high? Well, when the temperature goes up, the room tries to cool because the temperature is high. And so my supply is driving up. Instead of running it men like it's supposed to, except when there's a call for uh, cooling, it was running at the, at the max end, the top end. So the whole purpose to doing an upgrade is to save energy. If you got supply valves 100% open and running, exhausting, put them in cool, Tempered air, and then you exhaust them because when the supply goes up, the exhaust goes up as well to keep the space negative. So, um, the whole concept of being aware of how temperature affects all aspects of the environment, you know, that was learned here. Even with my electronic background, 
Had enough of me dealing with temperature like that, you know. I'm dealing with electron flow. Um, not, not temperature, but that's the reality of it. Um, great experience for me. Uh, I would really like to see more young people getting at a young age, so when they get to be 30, they pretty much, you know, they grew up being. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah, I, I, I applaud you and your fellow students for the, I think it's a terrific idea. I've never heard of anybody doing that. I'm, it sounded like you wanted you you adopted the high school and you were going to go there and do maybe almost community service kind of thing, mm -hmm. helping do different activities and stuff. So uh, I was going to ask the question about enrollment. So there's a connection there, and Brian said it went up. So what? How did you engage the students about this program and let them know? Did they just come and say, "Hey, why are you here? What do you do at the college?" Or so in the evenings we would have we would have meetings. This was typical of the club that we had, the, the Good Knowledge Mission Club, we have meetings, and ideas are put on the table. For me personally, I seen that there was a certain kind of connection, if you will, between us standing in the laboratory, doing everything we're doing here, and then we go out amongst the school and do things. We seem to get more energy and electricity when you go outside the classroom, right? So I was always interested in what can we do outside the classroom? We have to be inside the classroom to get our grades. So I don't want to think about things to do inside the classroom. What can we do outside the classroom? And ideas just kind of come from the from the student body. Someone decided, well, let's go um, uh, out in the community and have barbecue. Well, that's great. Let's meet people. Well, let's meet people, you know. And that's really, truly how it goes. One idea, the synergy leads to another idea. And it wasn't like some one person, not even myself, had these great ideas to do, do, to do everything. I would say the one thing I brought to the table was my need, my insistence on having participation from the whole crew, the whole group. So I guess my question though is, you, you didn't go out there and start talking about building automation systems to the students. You engaged them in other ways, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so what, where was the transfer? What was the tickler that got the students interested and then they don't want to come to Brian's program? Now, I'm looking for that because I want to repeat what you've done. <laughs> it was really for the counselor. The high school counselor making an impression on both the art director and the counselor because they had no idea that, that this was a viable pathway. So counselors in this area were solely focused, as Earl mentioned, on four-year degree programs as the path to success. Right. We were trying to change that dynamic. And Clarkson High School for us is right across the street. So forming that first bridge and a relationship there was key in starting to move the bar for these counselors. And subsequent to that, I don't know if you were involved, but a couple of state representatives here uh, in our in DeKalb County. Um, then subsequently, I think you were here, Stephanie Benfield and Michelle Henson and some of those state representatives who still are state representatives. Stephanie is the director of sustainability for the city of Atlanta. Okay. They coordinated meetings in this building based on some of the work we had done with high schools to gather counselors together and push the message that four-year university education is not the route to success for everybody. When you can get that kind of um, community interest in, in uh, a champion pushing the cause, communicating that message to counselors at the high school level, then you really have something. And that Earl's project and the Building Technologies Club project really greased the tracks because when they see motivated students, and we had 83 or 85, something like that, these were really engaged students. You usually don't see that kind of culture developing with people hungry to learn. Wow, when state representatives or high school counselors, or you can feel that energy, and then they get energized. And then from there, that's the leverage point where we're able to, to so get the message out. So right now, you'll hear from um, Judge Chief Judge Linda Haynes in the morning, Chief Juvenile Court Judge Linda Haynes. Her son is in the program right now. We have another state representative uh, who came back. Her son, um, forget her name now, Mike uh, came back, I think you might know him, Michael. Right. Uh, oh, I know you're about. I can't remember. His sister's a mechanical engineer. Yeah, so all that is still an outcome and paying dividends from the work that they did out in the community. So it wasn't necessarily we got a lot of high school students from Clarkston in particular, but we had a buzz that started because of the work that Earl and the Building Technology Club did. Uh, and I'm sure we had, had some students coming out of Clarkston High School because it's right across the street. But it was more. You, you, you kind of went out there and then I'm thinking like Tom Sawyer painting the fence, you know, and everybody, you know, what are you doing? And then it kind of, and it started coming this direction. In other words, it wasn't a hard sell. It was just, they got interested in seeing you guys, uh, you folks doing stuff out there. And it, it, 
and they organized cookouts for you know, the kind of like they, a terrific idea. They even cookouts that brought over well, it must have been 150, 200 people within the college itself. Yeah. And to remember that, mm -hmm. where they're doing hot dogs and hamburgers, but the instructors and administrators seeing that kind of energy, we can see, you can feel it. It was having that of, culture and energy really drives change within the institution. Yeah, I think it was uh, just breaking the, the pattern of mundane activity, come to work, do the thing, and go home, you know. And uh, we want to definitely do things and have events that interact with people even outside of college. I can't say it enough, but I think that's critical to keeping people energized about coming to a school where you don't have a big football game, a big, you know, all of that's about human interaction. And in reality it is. People are seeking human interaction. And in the midst of that, they want to be um, appreciated to some degree. So if you can create the opportunity for those two things by going out to the local schools, right, and energizing the kids to do something, where they can win something to be appreciated, you it's a twofold kind of feeding two needs at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about. <laughs> any, any questions? Any, any more questions? questions? Anyone think of starting the program and kind of curious as to what classes do you want to offer for the program? Well, I'm, I'm starting a, I'm developing a renewable energy program. Mm -hmm. um, it's launched a biotech program. I'm developing a renewable energy program scheduled to launch next fall. So that's what I'm working on. And I see a potential pathway for some students to enter the building automation. Sure. Um, being able to read mechanical drawings is going to be something they want to definitely come out of school. They don't have to be experts at it. They just have an idea what a valve looks like, what different symbols mean different types of valves. Those basic um, skills when you come into the industry are valuable because not many people that's new in the industry know these things. They do a job all day long and not understand anything about the paperwork, the drawings that goes with the job. Right? They just, just tell me where to go, what to, what to do, and that's all you want to do. So when your students come into the industry, actually have a clue about what the building is trying to do as far as function at a reduced cost. And the systems that we're investing in are to do just that, right? And it kind of kind of gives them a little bit <coughs> over the guy that's been there seven years running wire. That's that's all you do is just run wire, you know. Um, nothing wrong with that. But the students come out of the program want to do more than just run wire. Right? And they and they would be prepared to do more than just run wire. Um, for what it's worth, my company we make green cherry baths. And one of our selling points in our valves is that we're going to potentially reduce some of the cost of your energy through airflow, right? Because our valves are pressure independent. And compared to a VAB box, as the pressure goes up and down, and it's going to go up and down in the exhaust system. And, so, and uh, uh, that VAB box is going to have CFM airflow going up and down as well, right? And our systems are a lot more stable. You can run them in the mean. When they should be in the mean, they stay in the mean, as long as the pressure is within a certain range, right? And uh, over time, they can save the quite a bit of money. So, um, there was a, the timing was great, because there was a time where we was kind of putting money into sustainable technologies, people getting excited about it. And so, uh, I don't know if that time is still here, but I know every job I go on, that's the primary focus of the building owner. You know, saving money. And so you pay commissioning agents to make sure the systems being installed are actually running the way they're supposed to run because he's hoping to save money with these systems. So, any other questions? Earl, did you say that you started out with aviation maintenance or was that avionics? So, avionics is what it's called. Oh, okay. So, um, after the boot camp, I went to Desert Storm for two years. And I went in with the Navy had a program that was called a, a um, non-designated program. I wanted to win Marines. I just got to say this. I really wanted to join Marines, but I absolutely had a problem with someone telling me 
Based on your scores, they're going to go here, and that's it, that's all. That just didn't fit well with me. It, it, to this day, it don't, you know. Um, but that's the way it worked. <laughs> so the Navy, at least, they say you can take the same test, but based on your scores, you're going to choose from these schools. Well, that was a much better option to me. Then they had a program that was even going to step further, and they said you can take the test and not choose anything. And not even do a four-year commitment, give me a two-year commitment, active duty, at the end of your two years, you've had a chance to see what other people are doing, and you can choose the school then. Now you got to take a test to get into that school. If you score high enough, or you've already scored high enough, you can go right into the school. And that's the apprenticeship program that I'm in under, and uh, I'm glad I did. You know, worked out great for me. I did uh, eight years. Mostly in Florida, Jacksonville, Naval Aviation, working on 60s. That's a Seahawk helicopter used for anti submarine warfare. Okay. And I got my introduction to basic electricity and advanced electronics all at the same time. It was great. Did that for eight years, considered going into an officer program. Uh, wanted to go into it, and got introduced to politics. Didn't care for that either. So I had job opportunities. With Bill, it's called Illinois yeah, Bell, Bill, Bill Bell, and it changed shortly thereafter to AT and T. No, to Ameritech and then AT and T. Whatever, who cares? But went up there with them in uh, broadcasting. Um, everyone else in the group that I was in had an FCC license. I had a license in fiber optic installation, and the company was transitioning from everything being done over old microwave and copper to fiber. So that's how I got my hand there. And I, uh, like I said, I thought it would be no problems coming out here to get a job. Who was going to hire me, right? But the economy was depressed. It didn't matter what your skills were. Um, when it went south, things went south, and people had master degrees trying to get a job for $10 an hour. Literally, it was that bad. Well, the reason I ask is because <clears throat> we recently uh, interviewed a uh, former avionics mm -hmm. um, officer from the military to mm -hmm. or like personnel. And she also found her way to building automation. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I'm just wondering if you know of others that you, you know, worked alongside that kind of found their way into this path. And, I mean, it seems to me that it would be a really great you know, way to get a foundation. Sure, you know? sure. Uh, not building automation, I do know I that went into uh, engineering of some sort, uh, but not building automation. That's just me personally. Um, but uh, there's a lot of logic in in an airplane being able to deploy on a ship, a small ship. So my my aircraft deployed on small ships, which may need to fold up, become compact, fit into a little compartment. For maintenance, and then when it's time to come out, come back out on deck, like a transformer, transform, and then go into flight, you know. So there's a lot of automation involved in that. As a matter of fact, the first award, I don't want to worry about too much of all this stuff, but the first award I got was because the system was so automated, it had a great full system that was very interlock and automated, right? And most guys got so used to using what's called a cheater box, where you go up, plug into the system, and manually take one blade at a time. And put it in position. And that was easier than making sure all the switches, all the adjustments, all the, the blades and everything lined up properly, where you can just hit a button and it folds up and stop by the was kind of the So I fixed mine and then my uh, detachment chief, he's the leader, he said, okay, that was great. Can you fix the other bird too? Then I fixed that one. Then the command said, okay, fix all of them. And so I fixed all 12 to work properly. And he gave me the highest award, it's called Navy Achievement Medal, Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal. It's the highest award, non-combat award you can get in the Navy. I had three of them before I got out of service. Four, working on some system. That was the first one. So there's a lot of um, relationship between naval aviation. I would imagine probably all electronic jobs to some degree. I think what we're trying to do is to find a way to connect with those outgoing avionics techs. Yeah. I mean, that's one way. Um, they have a program in the military, in the Navy, 
that when you're getting ready to separate uh, companies that are interested in hiring military people, it's kind of hard to get to find out where it's at in the city, right? But um, this it was called TAP in the Navy, Transitioning Something Program, Transitioning Assistance Program, what it was called yesterday. Okay, this program was a, uh, an opportunity for employers to get military people and for military people to come out and go right into uh, either education or uh, employment. Um, TAP is a federal program, maybe something you want to look into, uh, getting potential candidates for your program. You know? uh, anything else? Anything else? Well, thank you all for listening. Hope I didn't bore you too much. <laughs>